Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation on pressure reducing regulators, brought to you by Swage Luck Northern California, suppliers of critical fluid systems throughout Northern California and Northwest Nevada. I'm your host, Fiona Hughes, and I'm joined today by a leading regulator expert, Eric Kaler, who has kindly offered to present today's webinar on the theory and operation of pressure reducing regulators. The session will be recorded, and for the next 30 or so minutes, Eric will introduce us to regulators, cover the basics of what a regulator is and how it works, as well as explore some common misconceptions. Then he'll spend about 10 minutes answering your questions, so do please jot them over in the chat box so we, Eric can address them later. As some background, Eric joined Swage Lock 17 years ago, fresh out of university, with a mechanical engineering degree and started as a lab engineer at Swage Lock working on high purity fittings and pipe fittings. He's since worked in new product development as well as assembly engineering and today Eric is based in San Diego as a field engineer. Now he's well aware that customers already have their hands full with their own jobs so no one expects them to be regulator experts which is where he comes in. In fact, Eric spends at least half of his life on the road meeting customers and discussing solutions to their needs as he travels to customer sites throughout the Western US, Canada, and Mexico. And as a bonus, following today's webinar, Eric will be manning the phones this afternoon and taking calls and answering regulator questions on a one-to-one -one basis. So that's an ideal opportunity for you to talk with Eric later and discuss your specific system needs. It'll be on a first come, first serve basis, so please go to www.norcal.swagelock.com to schedule a free phone consultation. But for now, let's hand the mic over to Eric Kaler and step us through the presentation. Eric? Thanks, Fiona. Good morning, everybody. As Fiona said, we're going to spend some time this morning talking about our introduction to the theory and operation of pressure reducing regulators. Before we get started, what would you say if I told you that we run into a great many regulators that are misapplied? And as you think about that, we're going to talk about our agenda for today. One of the things we're going to spend some time on is the operating principle of the pressure reducing regulators, which comes down to a simple balance of forces. We're going to talk about different sensing elements, compare hard seat versus soft seat designs, talk about a few different loading mechanisms, and then throughout the presentation and at the end, there's going to be a few terms we talk about as well that will help you um, understand product literature a little bit better and communicate what's happening with your regulators to the manufacturer. So let's start with uh, the operating principle on pressure reducing regulators, and ultimately, a pressure reducing regulator is intended to take a high inlet pressure, reduce it to a controlled outlet pressure, and keep that outlet pressure controlled regardless of variations to inlet pressure or variations to downstream flow. What's happening in the regulator is that you really have three different zones, so to speak, in the regulator. On the top part of the regulator, you have your loading mechanism. So in the cutaway that we're seeing here, we have a spring-loaded regulator. In the middle part of the regulator, you have your sensing element. And then in the lower part of the regulator, you have your internal regulator forces, some pressure forces and so forth. So in the simplest of terms, you can think of your regulator as a seesaw. And the seesaw is balancing around that sensing element. On one side, you're going to have your internal forces. On the other side, you're going to have your loading forces. And that would be the spring force we saw on the previous slide. To go back into the regulator and see how all of these forces apply, our loading force comes in above the sensing element, and then we have some inlet forces. In this case, an inlet spring force, our outlet pressure forces, and our inlet pressure forces. And all of these build up into our force balance equation. So we have loading forces equal to our internal forces in the regulator. Moving on to talk about sensing elements, and we talked about that sensing element is that balancing point of our seesaw. So it's kind of crucial in the regulator 
to see how that, uh, that balancing point is going to work. And there are two, really two options on sensing elements, diaphragm sensing and piston sensing. The diaphragm sensing regulators are going to be more sensitive. The diaphragm material is going to flex more easily with changes to your internal forces or your loading forces. We have a wide range of materials available on the diaphragm material, everything from metallics to uh, PTFE, elastomers, a broad range of materials for compatibility with your system. The downside is diaphragm sensing regulators are only good at lower pressures. And the second sensing mechanism is a piston sensing regulator. Uh, the piston sensing regulators are going to be used for higher pressures. They're not as sensitive as the diaphragm sensing regulators, but a piston sensing regulator is going to be more robust. So for instance, if you're using uh, maybe a uh, piece of reciprocating equipment in your system, uh, a compressor perhaps, you're going to have minor um, pressure fluctuations, almost like a pressure vibration in your fluid going downstream. If you're using a diaphragm sensing regulator, that those minute pulsations will eventually wear the diaphragm and cause it to fail. You won't have those same issues with a piston sensing regulator. The next thing we want to talk about are the differences between hard seats and soft seats internal in the regulator. A soft seat design is typically intended for the lower pressure applications. And basically you've got a machined metallic seat and then your seat seal is going to be an O-ring in the poppet. And that O-ring in the poppet, it's soft, so it will overcome maybe some amount of contamination or some wear on the seat. Again, the downside is this is a, a lower pressure type of, of seat for the regulator. The other type of regulator seat is going to be the hard seat design. And the hard seat design is a machine poppet that seats into typically a, a plastic type of seat. Um, PCTFE and PEAK are two very common materials for the hard seat design. The downside of the hard seat is that it's not as forgiving as the soft seat design, but it is used it is used at much higher pressures than you can use a soft seat at. Now you may wonder why the seats are important, and that brings us to our first term. And this term is creep. And creep is an inlet and outlet pressure, an increase in outlet pressure, typically caused by regulator seat leakage. So the first thing we need to remember is that regulators are not a shutoff device. And as we have wear on the seat, or perhaps um, maybe some misalignment of poppet in the seat or so forth, you will have a little bit of that higher pressure seeping across the seat, raising pressure on the outlet side. So if you do need to have shutoff at or before your regulator, it's always best to install a valve before the regulator and not rely on the regulator itself as a shutoff device. Additionally, uh, having good filtration in your system is going to be important to keeping your seat healthy and minimizing creep and seat leakage. The next thing we're going to talk about are three different types of loading mechanisms. The first type is a spring-loaded regulator. These are more common types that uh, most people are typically used to seeing. The second type is a dome-loaded regulator. And the third type is a combination spring and dome load regulator. A spring-loaded regulator is uh, really very common. And what you have, your loading mechanism is a spring. So as that spring is compressed, as you turn the handle in and compress the spring, that generates the load on the sensing mechanism. So in the diagram that we're seeing here, the load generated by the spring is less than the internal forces of the regulator. So our sensing mechanism is, is still held upward, keeping the poppet in the seat. Now if we jump ahead and see in a case where our loading forces, our spring forces, are higher than our internal forces, now our sensing element has flexed downward, pushing the poppet out of the seat, allowing that higher pressure to come across the seat of the regulator, raising the outlet pressure of the regulator. Spring-loaded regulators are available in, in a number of different configurations and styles. Shown here are, are instrumentation type on the left and process type regulators on the right. 
You'll still notice that they are both spring-loaded regulators, though. And then every regulator is going to have a flow curve. And what's important to note about the flow curve is as our pressure increase or as our flow increases from left to right across the bottom of the flow curve, we do have a drop off in pressure. Which brings us to our second term. That drop off in pressure is called droop. So just to, to redefine it, droop is a decrease in outlet pressure caused by an increase in flow rate in a pressure reducing regulator. And that's going to be important to our discussion as we move into our second loading mechanism, dome-loaded regulators. A dome-loaded regulator relies on a fluid pressure above the sensing mechanism as your loading mechanism instead of a spring. So in the case shown here, our loading pressure, our fluid pressure above the sensing mechanism is lower than our internal forces. So our poppet is still in the seat of the regulator. Once that fluid pressure, our loading force, exceeds the uh, internal, for internal forces in the regulator, the sensing mechanism flexes downward, pushing the poppet out of the seat, allowing additional pressure to come across the seat, raising the outlet pressure of the regulator. So as an example of a dome-loaded regulator, it's kind of shown on the slide here, uh, one question that typically comes up is, how do you manage that pressure in the dome? And as you can see from this example, we've got a smaller spring-loaded pilot regulator that controls the pressure in and out of that dome. Okay. And that's illustrated on this slide. We have high-pressure fluid designated by the red line flowing to the inlet port of our dome-loaded regulator and to the inlet port of our pilot regulator. We adjust the pressure coming out of the pilot regulator, so we're turning that handle and changing the compression on that spring to control the outlet pressure of the pilot regulator into the dome. And the pressure in the dome is basically the pressure out of the dome-loaded regulator. It's typically a one-to-one -one relationship between the pressure in the dome and the pressure out of a dome-loaded regulator. There are a couple of special case regulators where you can get uh, different ratios than one-to-one, -one, but one-to-one -one is the most typical, typical ratio. So we have our pressure coming out of our pilot regulator into our dome, and then you'll also see we have a second line coming out of the dome into the low pressure side of the regulator. At the point where that second line connects to the low pressure side of the regulator, you'll see there's a symbol for an orifice fitting. So you have a small orifice on that outlet side coming out of the dome, which allows a small amount of flow to flow out of the dome and into the outlet side of the regulator. This allows us to take that pilot regulator and adjust the pressure upward or adjust the pressure down. If we didn't have that outlet loop, we'd be able to continue to raise the pressure in the dome, but we wouldn't have a way to drop the pressure in the dome. So that outlet loop's important to give us dynamic control of the pressure in our dome-loaded regulator. So looking back at a, a live example of a dome-loaded regulator on the back side, you can see how that we take a, a, a tap from the high-pressure side, run it into the pilot regulator, and then we control the pressure with the pilot regulator into the dome, and we have our outlet loop out of the dome and into the low pressure side of the regulator. And that fitting that connects back into the low pressure side of the regulator is typically that bleed fitting that restricts the flow to the outlet side. So when we talked about flow curves a little bit ago and talked about how important droop is, what you'll see here is uh, the blue line is a typical spring-loaded pressure-reducing regulator's flow curve. It's got pretty substantial droop across this full flow range. That red line represents the flow curve of a dome loaded regulator. So it's a little bit more horizontal, a little bit more stable pressure across, across a wider range of flows. So that's the benefit of a dome loaded regulator is that it helps drive your flow curve closer to horizontal. So you have more stable pressure across the range of flows going through your system. Some options that we can do to dome-loaded regulators are to add some feedback. In the case shown here, we're taking a feedback point further downstream of the regulator and passing that to the, the dome portion of the, uh, the system. So our regulator now, instead of balancing on internal forces of the regulator, is balancing 
on that pressure that's coming that's being fed back from further downstream. And this allows us to kind of get away from any uh, pressure drop that we're going to get after our regulator in the system. And we know any device we put in a system, whether it's a, a valve or an elbow, you're going to have a little bit of pressure drop several diameters of your tubing downstream after the device. Feedback to your dome-loaded regulator helps get past the point of that continued pressure drop to where the pressure is more stable. And now you're managing the pressure out of your dome-loaded regulator down at a point where it's more stable or maybe more it's maybe it's more important to be have an exact pressure at that point than you would with a standard dome loaded regulator. The second option would be to take that external feedback and instead of running it to the dome, run it to the pilot regulator. This system is going to give you the same benefits that the external feedback to the dome loaded regulator is going to give you, but it's going to be more responsive. So it's going to react a little bit more quickly. So if we plot these additional flow curves with the two that we saw before, our blue line is still our spring-loaded regulator. The red line is our standard dome-loaded regulator. And then we have two additional lines that are going to be our external feedback options. So you can see as you apply some of these additional options on the regulator, it continues to push your flow curves closer to horizontal. Now the best case that we can do is to use an electronic pilot regulator on a dome-loaded regulator and push that flow curve basically to horizontal across the full flow range until you get to choke flow through the regulator. An example of a dome-loaded regulator with external feedback to the pilot is showing, shown here. And you can see the plumbing that's installed on the regulator, taking that feedback point downstream and running it back to your pilot regulator. A regulator like this is probably used in some uh, bulk gas distribution got very large inlet and outlet connections, uh, but it is thin wall tubing, so you wouldn't expect tremendously high pressure. The next loading mechanism to talk about is our combination spring and dome loaded regulators. In this case, our loading mechanism is going to be a combination of our spring forces plus our pressure forces above our loading or above our sensing mechanism. Internally, it's going to look like this. You still have a dome loading chamber where you pressurize with your, your dome loading forces, and you have a load spring that can be set to whatever, whatever load you want out of your spring. The best way to understand the use of a differential pressure regulator is to look at it in an application. So the application shown here, we've got a rotating equipment, a pump, for instance. And this pump has shaft seals that we need to keep at 15 PSI higher than the pressure inside the pump. So we go to our differential pressure regulator, we set our spring load to 15 PSI. Then we um, tap a small amount of pressure off the pump and feed that directly to our dome chamber of our differential pressure regulator. So now the pressure out of our regulator is going to be whatever our pump pressure is plus 15 PSI from the spring, thereby always keeping our, seal, our pressure in our seals 15 PSI higher than the pressure in the pump itself. Now, there's a few other terms that we want to talk about that'll help understand what's going on with the regulators and maybe help you understand how regulators are acting in your system. The first term is lockup. And as you're decreasing flow, so on our flow curve, you're going from right to left, as you get close to your zero flow condition, as you get close to that, that vertical axis on the left-hand side of the graph, you'll see a sudden spike in pressure, and that's called lockup. The reverse of lockup is seat load drop. So as you're moving away from the zero flow condition and you're moving towards the right on your flow curve, you start flowing through your regulator, you'll see an initial drop in pressure before the regulator stabilizes. So lockup and seat load drop are kind of the reverses of each other, depending on which direction you're going on your flow curve. But it's important to know that if you're trying to use your regulator too close to that axis, too close to the zero flow condition, you're going to have very sporadic performance. Your pressures are going to be erratic um, and jump pretty, pretty wildly up and down within the seat load drop or lockup range. Once you move beyond that, you should have more stable performance. So it's important when you're sizing a regulator to make sure you're sizing yourself 
out into your normal flow range outside of that seat load drop and lock up area. The next thing to talk about is supply pressure effect. And supply pressure effect is basically any change of your inlet pressure to your regulator is going to cause an inverse effect on the outlet pressure of that regulator. Now, it makes sense to actually look at an example of this to understand it a little bit better. So here we've got a regulator, and we're going to suppose that it has a supply pressure effect of 1%. Connected to a cylinder, so we have 3,600 PSI on the inlet side, and we have the regulator set to 50 PSI on the outlet side. As we use the gas in our cylinder, the pressure in the cylinder decreases from 3,600 PSI to 2,600 PSI. Since our regulator has a supply pressure effect of 1%, we're going to see a 1% increase on our outlet side of that change. So we've dropped 1,000 PSI. 1% 1 of that is 10 PSI. So now our outlet pressure is going to rise from 50 PSI up to 60 PSI. And this is all just because of that balancing of forces internal in our regulators. Continuing the example, if we dropped another 1,000 PSI, because we continue to deplete our, our pressure in our cylinders. Now we're down from 3,600 to 1,600. 1% 1 of that decrease is 20 PSI. So our outlet pressure is going to rise from 50 PSI up to 70 PSI. So you can begin to see that supply pressure effect can, can have a negative impact on the performance of your regulators and on the performance of your system especially if that outlet pressure starts to rise beyond a point that it's going to damage some instruments, uh, maybe set off relief valves and waste product or cause some sort of incident. So the question is, how do we manage supply pressure effect? And there's really two ways to do it. Two-stage pressure reduction or making some modifications to the control mechanism internal in the regulator. Two-stage pressure reduction can be done in a two-stage regulator, shown there on the left or it can be done by two regulators in series, shown there on the right. The second way to do the, to uh, manage supply pressure effect is to modify the control mechanism. And the control mechanism is really the interaction between the poppet and the seat internal in the regulator. On the left, we have an unbalanced poppet design. So our inlet pressure forces are going to act to push that poppet up into the seat. And those inlet pressure forces are going to act on all the surfaces underneath the poppet. The balanced poppet design is shown on the right. You can see it's got an orifice machined through the poppet, allowing the outlet pressure to be resident below the poppet as well as above the poppet. So you still have some small area that the inlet pressure forces can act on pushing the poppet up but they're minimized compared to the unbalanced poppet design. Okay. So, ba so balancing the poppet uh, reduces the area on which our inlet pressure forces can work. It uh, makes the regulator less sensitive to supply pressure effect, but also gives us the advantage that we can use a larger seat on the regulator to allow more flow through the product than we would if we had an unbalanced poppet design. Thank you, Eric. Since that concludes the primary presentation, we're going to have a few minutes now of Q&A so Eric can respond to some of the questions that were raised by participants today. And our first question is from Jake, who asks, how important is knowing the flow that I need? Um, good question, Jake. There, there's three really important characteristics that you need to know when sizing a regulator. Um, one of those is the flow required through the regulator. A second is knowing your inlet pressures, and that includes any variation you're going to have in your inlet pressures. And then your control pressure, and how tightly controlled you need to have that control pressure or outlet pressure of your regulator. So if you know those three things, along with the basics of your system, what fluid you're using, temperatures, and so forth, it's pretty easy to size a regulator. But if you don't know what the flow requirement is, then we're going to struggle a little bit trying to put the, the right regulator in place so that you're not working in that choke flow zone 
or in the area that we talked about earlier, the, uh, the lock-up or seat load drop area. Good. Thank you. Hamid writes then, what happens if you oversize a regulator, Eric? If you oversize a regulator, um, and I'm taking that to mean that you put a regulator into your system that is too big for the application. So your, your poppet and your seat are going to be too large, allowing too much flow through the regulator. So what's going to happen is every time that regulator opens, it's going to open up and allow more flow through the system than you would expect. So that regulator is going to be doing more work than, than it would need to do. It'll probably, um, your control pressure downstream is not going to be as precise as it could be with a properly sized regulator. You're going to see a little bit more fluctuations in downstream pressure, and you're going to see spikes in your flow downstream as well. Yeah, good question. And David's just chimed in with, conversely, what about undersizing a regulator? Um, undersizing is going to, to have a, a similar effect in that you're, instead of having a seat and poppet configuration that is too large for the system, you're going to have a seat and poppet configuration that is too small for the system. So when it opens, it's going to open it and open as much as it can to allow as much flow as possible through. You're probably going to be working more towards the right-hand side of your flow curve, closer to the choke flow range. You're going to have less ability to get a higher pressure out of your regulator, so your control pressures won't be as high as maybe you need them to. And you're also going to potentially, depending on the media and the system, erode your seat much more quickly than you would with a properly sized regulator. Good. Good. Anyone else? Last orders for any questions to pose to Eric? And by the way, if you'd like to get more in-depth with Eric, don't forget that you can set up a personal phone consultation with him this afternoon so that you get to discuss your specific needs and any questions. And to arrange that, please go to www.norcal.swagelock.com or give a call to 510-933-6200. That's 510-933-6200. One other quick question coming up. Can you describe the effect on supply pressure of, two, uh, uh, of the two-stage regulator? Okay, good question. So I'm going to back up here if I can to the two-stage regulator. So if we look at, our, look at the image on the right-hand side, it's a two-stage pressure regulator. We're going to have the supply pressure effect acting on both regulators. And we remember that it's an inverse effect. So on our first, if we look at the picture on the right-hand side and assume flow is going from left to right. So it's going to go first through that spring-loaded regulator and then second through that dome-loaded regulator. As pressure decreases on our inlet side, we see the inverse effect on the outlet side of our first regulator. So if we stay with the example we looked at a few minutes ago where we drop from 3,600 PSI down to 1,600 PSI on our inlet pressure, and we're trying to control a 50 PSI outlet pressure. Now the outlet pressure of that first stage is going to go from 50 to 70. That second regulator, instead of seeing a decrease on inlet pressure, sees an increase on inlet pressure. So the pressure to the second regulator goes from 50 to 70. So your, that second regulator will see a decrease in outlet pressure that's 1% of that change. So you have that 20 um, PSI change, so you'll see 1% of that on the outlet side. So if we imagine that we were um, maybe regulating down from 50 to 10 PSI, that 10 PSI would go up um, point, uh, point 0.2 from 10 to 10.2, or go, I'm sorry, go down from 10 to 9.8. So you can see as you have a two-stage pressure reduction, you still have supply pressure effect affecting both regulators, but you use them together to manage the effect that the change in supply pressure has on your final outlet pressure. Okay. Thank you very much. Here's another question. Can you discuss the difference between liquids and gases in regulators? Okay, good. Uh, so the difference in liquid and gases in regulators really has to do with sizing. Um, liquids, 
are, are a little bit more straightforward because they're non-compressible. So whatever your flow coming into your regulator is, it has to be the flow that's coming out. There's no way to compress it internally in the regulator. So it's a little bit more straightforward on sizing. Um, gases are a little bit different in sizing because you can have some compressibility going on. So there's different sizing methodologies when looking at gases versus liquids in the regulators. As you look at the function of the regulator with a liquid or a gas, uh, it doesn't typically matter if it's liquid versus gas, but one thing to be aware of is if you're using a liquid, they may have some suspended particulate or something like that, that you could have some long-term effect and wear on your seat over that time. Thank you. Another question here. Does supply pressure effect happen with liquids and gases? Yes. Yeah, it's the supply pressure effect is, um, let's back up. It's really based on our Florence balance equation that we talked about very early on in the presentation. So as I bounce back through everything to get to that slide. Okay. Um, so if we, if we aren't changing anything on our loading forces, our F1, so our F1 is staying the same, our sensing mechanism is going to be working to balance out against that loading force. What we're seeing change is our F4. So supply pressure effect is really F4 in this force balance equation changing. So if F4 goes down as we deplete the gas in our cylinder, the only way to counterbalance it is to have F3 increase. And that's really independent of a gas or a liquid in the regulator. It's just the, the way the balance of forces works. Something has to change if our inlet pressure changes. And it works out that what has to change is the outlet, outlet pressure. Good. All right. Well, I think that concludes our questions. Now, if you'd like to just go back to that slide, Eric, so that uh, people can see the phone number and uh, the web address to be able to contact and set up a scheduled call, that would be great. And by the way, yeah, a link to today. Yeah. I'm sorry, Fiona. I hear that we have one more, maybe one more question that has come in. Can you use a back pressure regulator for overpressure protection? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Back pressure regulators can be used for overpressure protection, and um, it, it's, it probably requires a little deeper discussion than than just a few sentences. But uh, a lot of times you'll you'll see people who will elect not to use a back pressure regulator and instead use a relief valve. And there are cases where it's probably more important to use a back pressure regulator. Regulators are designed as dynamic devices. They're designed to always be in motion, always working around that sensing element to balance those forces. Whereas a relief valve is designed to stay closed and only open in an emergency sort of event. So a back pressure regulator for overpressure protection, um, depending how important it is to keep the the pressure upstream of the regulator constant, a back pressure regulator could be a better option than a relief valve. Good stuff. Well, we so appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions as well as make yourself available to answer those of some of our participants today in our afternoon session. And a link to today's presentation will be emailed to everyone, so if you wish to replay it or on forward it to colleagues, you can. But this just leaves me to say a special thank you to you, Eric, for sharing your knowledge of regulators, and in fact, to thank everyone who attended today. So from all of us at Swagelock, Northern California, we look forward to having you join us again for our next webinar topic. And from me, goodbye, and Eric, Thank you, Fiona. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day.